all give a round of applause for our cast and crew here. My name is Jamie Brodnax. I'm the founder and CEO of Black Girl Nerds. And thank you. Shake the booty for Black Girl Nerds. <laughs> And I'm really excited to host this panel today with the cast and crew of Tom Swift, which acknowledges black nerds, by the way. So, yes. <laughs> so let me start by introducing our panel, which obviously you guys are familiar with already. Um, so to my left here is April Parker Jones. We've got Albert Wongi. Marquise Wilson. She needs no introduction. Ashley Murray. Mr. Tian Richards himself. Noga Landau. Our producers. Melinda Sue Taylor. And Cameron Johnson. All right, so to get started, first of all, this show is so perfect right now. We need this show. Obviously, this month is Pride Month, so this is a perfect for your Pride programming, um, and it acknowledges so many marginalized groups, so such a great show to watch. Um, and I'm gonna start off, I had mentioned black nerds. I love how the pilot episode opens with Tom identifying him and his family as black nerds, and I wanna start off with you, Tian. Um, aside from Tom's black nerdiness, <laughs> um, what was it about the character that you found so intriguing? Ooh, um, I love how he exists within so many different groups and dualities. I love how he presents in the world with this strong, bold, confident persona. He holds no bars, takes no prisoners. But underneath that is such a deeply wounded and sometimes insecure person. And sometimes when you're confident in the world, people don't think that you have those scars underneath, and you do. Um, so he gets to show up in the world in that way, but also be this highly functioning, highly intelligent genius. And people just don't think those things exist in the packages that they come in, and, and they do. Like nerds, tech people, you know, people who are into STEM look so many different ways and we get to show a different face to that, which I love. Absolutely. Beautiful. Black gay billionaire into science and tech. It's a beautiful thing. I absolutely love it. Hot people do math too. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, oh, we adore you. We love you so much. That black dress was fire in the pilot episode. Yes. Thank you. I was freezing. <laughs> freezing. I'm freezing right now. I'm always cold these things. <laughs> Thank uh, you. You've described in the past, you've described Zenzi as the gravity to Tom Swift. Mm. Can you elaborate what you meant by that and what have you enjoyed most about playing her? Um, well, as you all just saw in this episode and the previous one, um, Tom can get, I'm looking at Tom, um, <laughs> Tom can be all over the place and it's, it's hard to keep up with him and to make sure that whatever it is that he's trying to achieve, that he can actually do it. And so having someone like Zinzi in his life to remind him that while you may be right, I'm right her. so... <laughs> That's the way this cookie crumbles. Like, in order to keep Tom grounded, he does need, you know, a little bit of sense. You know, like some people are book smart, but they're not always street smart. And look. She is coming for us today. <laughs> Me and Tom, she's coming. I am not coming for you. You just happen to be sitting there. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a two-handed thing, you know. It, Barclay is Tom's best friend and, and Zenzi is Tom's best friend. And you want somebody in your life who can be honest with you, even when it hurts, and they can be honest with you back. And so you have each other's back. You have each other's best interest at heart. And that is the gravity that keeps Tom grounded. Oh, April. 
I'm so concerned about what's going on in episode two now. <laughs> I'm scared. The lips. I know. Uh, you're the matriarch of the show, uh, but to me, you also serve as the anchor to Tom and Zenzi's characters. And we kind of saw that like in the dinner scene. Um, so, you know, and they're also dealing with this family loss. So tell us about Lorraine Swift and what have you found so compelling about playing her? Well, I think like, like Zenzi, you know, that she is, she is that anchor to, to Tom. Her and Tom have such a, a, a unique relationship because they, he, she's so charmed by him. Although there is a lot of disappointment that, that, that I have towards Tom at times because I feel like he's not living up to his full potential a lot. He still has a way of kind of pressing that soft spot in Lorraine. So there's this constant kind of just disappointment, push and pull of just, come on, get it together. Um, but what's, what's really, really unique is that at the end of the day, she, uh, Lorraine does know that, that Tom has what it takes to, to carry on the legacy of, of Swift Enterprises, although she does question it. Um, so we'll see that a lot unfold in these episodes, kind of that, that doubt and then re uh, confidence that she has back in him. So we'll see. We'll see how it all plays out. But there's definitely a lot of, of the push and pull of that dynamic of the disappointment that she has with her son. Yeah. yeah. We're going to form a prayer circle around Lorraine. We definitely need to form a prayer circle. <laughs> so three. three. Um, so Tom Swift is about black excellence, and we're seeing black excellence in a way that we haven't seen before with Again, a black gay billionaire. <laughs> Can't stress that enough. Coming from generational wealth and um, black LGBTQ represent representation in this upper class, upper social class tech community, which is quite riveting to watch. And for Marquise, um, how important is this for you, seeing trans roles normalized in this way and seeing your character playing this badass bodyguard, um, heroic figure who is the protector of the Swift family? First of all, it is absolutely amazing. Um, one, uh, just to start, so my, my last name is actually pronounced Vilsong. 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 Thank so you. So it's okay. Um, that happens a lot. Wilson's totally fine as long as it's not Wilson or Williams. <laughs> uh, no, it's super important. Um, I've really never seen a character exist in this way. It's really cool to see Isaac um, be a person of trans experience, but also simply exist in this space. The storyline is not specific to his transness. It's about being in support to not only Tom, but the entire Swift family. Um, and I think that's important for him, definitely as a trans person too, like kind of taking on this family in many ways and being his chosen family. Um, and it's really important to see not just trans people normalized, right, like being quote unquote physically present, but I think humanized. Um, and I think it'll take some time, of course, to, for audiences to really get a full sense of like who Isaac is, because um, right now it's a little slow to approach the way it's kind of like unfolding. Um, but it's super important to me. And I think it's, it's extremely important to queer people in general, definitely black queer people um, in relationship to this black family. That accent over the O is not for nothing. That's why it's Bill Song. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you for correcting me on that. Um, <laughs> Albert, so basically your character is sus. Uh, <laughs> we don't know what's going on, whose side you're on, where your allegiances lie. Uh, so what can you tell us so far about who Albert is um, and what his relationship is with uh, the Swift family? Um. Rowan in it. <laughs> uh, Rowan is, is definitely um, a very sus character, for sure. <laughs> um, the word I've been running with uh, recently is conflict. Um, I think, I don't want to give too much away, but that's the word I'd like, you know. And thank you guys, by the way, for coming to watch this, by the way. Um, <laughs> that, that's the word I feel like audiences I'd like them to unpack that about Rowan, because um, every character in this show is, is flawed and human and has their positives and, and negatives as well, just like all of us do, you know? So um, it'll be interesting to see what people can unpack about him, um, because he, he's very much an outsider, um, um, but also an 
inside or, or who knows. He's also really hot, which is kind of part of what yeah, matters. That accent strongly <laughs> suggests you watch episode three as well. Just, I don't know. Also, could I quickly? Um, uh, I'd like to also uh, just take a moment to acknowledge the the traditional owners of this land. Um, I was trying to memorize the names of the tribes, but um, I feel like I'll butcher them. So, is it okay if I read uh, the tribe names? Yes. And then you. So we do this a lot in Australia. I, I, I've lived in Australia for eight years and we always uh, acknowledge and pay our respects to um, the traditional owners of the land that uh, we meet on. So I just wanted to pay my respects to the Tonkawa people. Please correct me if anyone here is from any of these tribes, correct me um, about my pronunciation later on. Uh, ca cash me outside. <laughs> so uh, the Tonkawa, uh, the Lipan Apache, uh, the Karankawa, Comanche, and uh, uh, the Koltika people. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Rowan's, yeah, sus. <laughs> uh, Cameron, I want to make sure I get this right. In the pitch meeting for Tom Swift, uh, was the network looking for a show about a black gay guy with daddy issues? Where would you find one of those? <laughs> I don't know anyone like that. <laughs> no, uh, we were, I mean, I could give the, the, the brief version of the narrative is that I am dumb on Twitter and you should totally follow me at Cameron J. Awesome on all platforms. Uh, <laughs> and I got a DM from Josh Safran, who is the showrunner of a show called Gossip Girl. And he was like, would you like to staff on Gossip Girl? I said, absolutely, oh my God, I am gay. I have been alive since the 80s. I watched Gossip Girl. Uh, and so as a con and then in that meeting, one of our not writing producers, Les Rowinski, was in it, and she had this weird look on her face, and I was like, what is, does this look mean I'm not getting the job? Like, what is happening here? Uh, and a few days later, the, the email that came back was like, so we'd, uh, we're, we're not gonna hire you for Gossip Girl, but would you like to meet Nova Landau and Melinda Shoe Taylor of Nancy Drew? And I was, friend was like, for what? I was like, I don't really do ghosts. Like, what, what are we, it's not my, it's not my forte. And so we got to, to the meeting, and apparently, yes, they were looking for a black gay guy with daddy issues and some really good shoes. Have you gotten into this shoe? I'm in the Gucci shoes, yes. so, but that's just, this is just part, this is all archive. I didn't buy anything new. We're, we're just here. I had to resist. Uh, and so it began, but yeah, it's been a really incredible experience to see some of my a lot of the show is based on things that have actually happened to me. And so there's a version of this that happened to me when I was a kid where like I had a homophobic friend and he did some horrible shit to me and then I didn't tell and it was a whole thing. And it's been an incredible experience to put those things, stories on screen and be able to tell those sorts of stories that we don't necessarily get to expose. Uh, and then get to see it through the eyes of Tom and through Zenzi. Zenzi's actually named it for my best friend uh, who, and see it come to life and have it be, people laugh at it and think it's cool, so, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Noga, I understand um, that the casting process happened on Zoom um, because of COVID, it's right? <laughs> it did. Uh, and you've worked on countless other shows uh, where you've done in-person readings. So does the dynamic of in-person readings uh, change versus readings in person? <laughs> Uh, I actually like a Zoom read, and I'll tell you why. Please. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I have it's, it's always fun to be in the room with a person, obviously, and especially if you're doing a chemistry read with two actors, it's very cool to see how they talk to each other in real life, but it almost doesn't matter because no one's gonna, it's not a stage play, it's a TV show. So you're gonna see everybody on screen anyway, and I actually really loved Part of the process, we auditioned so many actors for the show and we landed on these amazing people, right? But I love seeing little snippets of their real lives behind them. Like I remember like when we were when we were with Ashley, she was always like in this sort of beautiful sunlight and like a white wall behind her. It was literally underneath the stairs in my bedroom. It was yeah. <laughs> a magical spot. I remember with April, she has like a, you must have like a whole setup in your home. No, 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 just a cute little backdrop, nothing fancy. A little tripod. It was polished. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was perfect and polished and it's everything that April really is. And I just, I feel like there's something, look, we went through a pandemic, we had to adapt. And I think that making the best of doing Zoom auditions, we really, we really did it and we wound up with exactly the cast that we needed to wind up with. You are leaving out um, the story of Albert's background, though. Be no! Who can tell it? Can I tell it? Can I, I think, tell it? I think, go, go ahead, team. Go okay, ahead. okay. So, picture it. Sicily, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, we were doing the... Chemistry reads. Chemistry reads, reads yes. And it was, uh, the, it was, Ashley was there, and uh, all the Zenzies, all the Rowans. And so, Albert comes on, and I had seen his headshot, and I was like, ooh, this is gonna be interesting. So he pops on in like this burgundy turtleneck, you know, beaming, you see the bright, beautiful smile. And I look, and above him is a sign that says, Beef Bar. Beef Bar. <laughs> Where did they do that? So I said, well, is it, brother, you in a restaurant? Like, what's going on? <laughs> And so, like our cast director, uh, Sandy Logan, shout out to Sandy. I was like, "Can you, can you edit it? Can you, like, you know, fix the frame?" And we're trying to figure it out. The Wi-Fi is shaky. My man's runs outside. He was like, "No, no, no, come back inside. We need you near the light." And so I was like, "You know, use your phone for for better signal." So he does that. We we get it tightly framed, and this man knocked it out the park. And here we are, rowing. Knocked it out the park from the beef bar. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 Awesome. Melinda, can you tell us about bringing on the legendary LeVar Burton on this show? He's a voice that we've all come to know and love, obviously through reading Rainbow and Jordy on Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, and he's kind of like the Jarvis of the Tom Swift universe now. Um, so how did he get brought onto the project? Well, we had, you know, this character written initially as a more whimsical, bubbly kind of version based on my younger son. Who his resting face is like, that's awesome! You know, so you can imagine Barkley doing that. But then we were thinking about who could we cast who was black and meaningful and into sci fi, and the name popped up LeVar Burton, and I just about fainted even at the thought of it. Because, sidebar, when I was a little kid growing up in Bangor, Maine, I was the only non white person in the whole state, just about, without exaggeration, I'm this legit fact. And I was very shy and isolated and timid and self conscious. I didn't look like anybody, and I hid in my bedroom my whole childhood reading The Lord of the Rings over and over again, or watching Star Trek, or you know, Star Wars is a huge influence, because in those stories, if you were different, it was cool, and you brought something to the party, and you could be a hobbit and save the world, and that's why I became a writer. So then, cut to we're like, talking to LeVar Burton, and he has decided to do the project, and I'm just like, giddy as a schoolgirl, and it was so magical, and I really wanted to get in a time machine and tell my younger self, just keep reading those books over and over and over again, it's gonna work out. So, he's amazing. <laughs> And he is a delight to work with. He's truly a mentor to Tian, to all of us. He's like, so kind and so humble, and yet he will casually say things like, well, when I was cast as Kunti Kinte, you know, I was right. like, coming out of My first film set with Cicely Tyson and Maya Angelou, and you're like. <laughs> He's also just very used to people meeting him and bursting into tears. Like, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lot. The that weirdest thing people. for me now at this point is because when we, when we shot the season, it, we always had somebody else reading Barclay's lines. Yeah. So it was either like our second AD, or the first, or T and Stanton. So I've heard every other voice but LeVar's <laughs> until it aired. And so what's, when I was watching the show air, I was like, Oh my God, did they not put LeVar's, who is that? <laughs> I literally, I was, I was about to text you, Cameron, I was like, oh my God, tell him to take it off, tell him to take it off right now, tell him to shut everything down, because that is not him. And I realized, because I was used to, what's your stand-up name? Uh, Shout out to David. David. I was, <laughs> I just thought like, I'm not even gonna say it, because I'm being recorded. It's fine, it's great, it's great, it's fine. It was, I just, I didn't know, I didn't know. So 
Some things we should keep in the house. <laughs> um, I'm going off script here a little bit, just seeing uh, episode two. I gotta know, whose idea was that to add sequins to an acid proof outfit? <laughs> what are you that. talking about? <laughs> Look, okay, here's the thing. Like, everything on this show has to be a little bit dumb. Like, just a little bit. <laughs> And so, a little bit gay. A little bit gay. A little bit gay. Let's be honest. How do you take like a, an acid-proof jumpsuit, which I tend to be known for a monochrome or a jumpsuit, uh, which you can all see on my Instagram. Um, but <laughs> at camera J awesome. <laughs> but with that said, like it was like how do we take? I think that my favorite sci-fi when I was growing up, and this is, is there's a lot of like fun like Star Trek and stuff like that in Star Wars. But I really love James Bond. And I really love Mission Impossible. And I love all of those sequences that, sequences that you get where James Bond is going through the Aston Martin that shoots missiles and the watch that will sober him up and also shoot missiles. And so the thought was, okay, like we're gonna need, we're gonna take leave-in conditioner and we're gonna make it into like a thing that will seal your body. We're gonna put it on a Gucci jumpsuit and then we're gonna need a rhinestone studded balaclava because that will look cool as we're going down. Um, it was Melinda who pointed out that we need to cut eye holes in it, and I was like, how dare you? <laughs> eye holes? Why would we do something like that? I was just thinking very- The conversation very... began with, what is a balaclava? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that is our dynamic as the, as the executive producers of this show. It's, cameras are something ridiculous. What is that exactly? Okay, let's do it. And here we are. Uh, shifting from wardrobe to hair and makeup, um, and this question is for April and Ashley. I saw that you guys did a panel at WonderCon, and there was a brief discussion about the hair and makeup team and behind the scenes crew members being people of color and how important is black women having your hair and makeup done by other black women and by people of color, so, and black, like black stylists. So can you just share again how important that conversation is? Because it's something that's not discussed often. I'd love you to start because you left the season with a whole fresh new look that was blessed upon you by our wonderful department. So start. It's, it's, it's vital. I mean, as, as artists, we want to be able to just to focus on what it is that we do, which is to create, hopefully, dynamic television. Um, but when you have to worry about your hair and makeup on top of that, it can take away from that. So to have uh, this, this uh, to be intentional about who does our hair and who does our makeup and it, and it, and it reflect who we are, it, it's, it, it, it's vital in that way that we can um, just be able to, to, to not have that added stress on top of us to, to try to have to worry about that. I can remember doing other shows and, and literally having to go home and uh, do my hair the night before and take that, you know, so it would take away time for me to prepare as an artist too. So now we can come to work, and I know Ashley can attest to this, we can come to work and not worry about, oh my gosh, are we gonna look like how our best, are we gonna, are we gonna look excellent? And the, you guys have done such a great job with uh, assembling the, the, the hair and makeup team uh, that we can be so confident in that way. So I'm just really grateful uh, to, be, to be able to, to be on the other side of it now. Um, I know Ashley has some probably similar stories uh, too, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I, I am not the first person <laughs> who has gone to work and had someone uh, not be able to do yeah. what you need them to do. And when, I, I've said it many times, when I was on Riverdale, I was responsible for my hair. Um, I could not have anyone else do it because no one else knew how. And having to be responsible for my role, as well as my character's look, and the continuity of it, and like the longevity throughout the entire season, going out and sourcing the products, you know, to, to get my hair done, like, it's a lot of work. And to come to the show and walk into a trailer where not only is everyone assuring me that I can relax, I actually did. I like I actually I didn't realize how how I have been held ever since I started working because I always had to mentally and emotionally prepare myself to do more than what I was hired to do. And to be able to let that go and to just focus on the work. It 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 is unbelievable how wonderful it is to come to work and do one job 
and it shows up more. I feel so much more comfortable when I'm working because I'm only thinking about the scene. I'm only thinking about the words. I'm only thinking about that and not, is my wig on straight? <laughs> is my neck matching my face? <laughs> Are my edges still intact? Right. You know, right. just like it's, I, I make a joke, but it, you know, they're, bless the edges that are no longer with us. <laughs> we should Maybe give a rest. shout out to Tyrone. Hello, oh, baby there. there. Tyrone is here, right? Tyrone is Tyrone. here. Tyrone! Yeah. One of our amazing barbers over on Tom Swift. Yes. Woo! In fact, you know, on the NCU, it's in Vancouver, there's a smaller pool of folks who really know how to do it. Like there's no pool. There's no pool. And that is, that's why, one of the reasons why we wanted to shoot the show in Georgia, um, in Atlanta. Shout out to but Atlanta. Love, I love Canada. I have many coats, but at the same time. A quick, a quick shout out to our hair person on Nancy Drew, who we brought on. We sourced a woman from a, a salon, actually. We had to find oh, wow. somebody at a salon, Shade, who's great. And she's now training up the rest of the crew. So if you're intentional, it can be done. Absolutely. All right, and I have one last question, and then we're going to open it up to you guys to ask questions of our panelists here. Um, what does the writer's room look like over at Tom Swift? Ooh, wow. It looks a little bit like the show. It looks a little bit like the yes. show. Yes! It does. Um, Noga and Melinda set an incredible precedent with Nancy Drew. I remember I was not, I did not write on the Nancy Drew TV show. I wrote an episode of Nancy Drew with them. And so I was in their room for two weeks and you walk in, I've been on, you know, <laughs> if you look up, I've been on some shows that weren't exactly super functional. And, um, uh, you know, you go into their room and it's intentionally diverse and it's not just black, white diverse, it's diverse with, in terms of ages and, you know, different ethnicities and women and so on and, that, and, and gender and all of that sort of stuff that you see on the screen, which is part of what makes Nancy Drew so great. And so our goal when we, when we set out to staff the Tom Swift room was, yes, how do we get as many interesting, cool people of color on this show, but how do we make sure that the points of view are diverse? The type of black person that I am and that I, the world that I grew up in, I mean, we're not billionaires, but you know, it's, Whatever, uh, and it's like there. It was you know there was is very different than like the lives of many of the other people who are on our show, and so we have, I think what's our, our gender balance is probably 50-50, 60-40. Uh, we got a lot of gay dudes with daddy issues. We got a lot of <laughs> women. Just gay dudes. With, oh, we got a lot of women with daddy issues. Melinda may want some have some things to add to that, but. <laughs> Yeah, our, our goal was to be as intentional as possible, as put, to put together a room full of people that could tell this story, and in addition to that, where no one would have to be a token. We have all been the only person in a room or in a space or whatever. And so whether that is, we don't just have one, we don't just have one white person, we don't just have one black, black woman, we don't just have one trans person, we have, we don't want anyone to have to be the only person speaking for their, for themselves. And so that's our goal. Awesome. Does anyone have questions for our panelists? Yes, sir. I, I'm wondering about the, the books. Was anybody familiar with the Tom Swift series beforehand? Did you all read any of the books? We I took a quick know. look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We yeah. took a spin through them. And you know what's, I feel like what's cool about the books is the sense of wonder, the sense of invention, optimism. Optimism. Yeah. 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 That's important. Friends are important. Mm -hmm. Totally. And Barclay. Barclays in the books. Some too. of the names, Eskel, yeah. you know, that's not a normal name. We yeah. take that from the books. The Road Back. But I did not, and that made it to the screen. And I think, you know, everything else that needed to be updated, because these books are very old, um, we were able to we were able to find the story that had to be told now. Anyone else? No, 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 no. First off, shout out to our amazing costume designer, Ayana James Kamadi. Yes. Yes. Listen, before this show, and all of you guys can attest to this, my wardrobe is very basic. I wear gym clothes. That's it. But since, you know, doing the episode of Nancy Drew, I've been able to learn about designers and different brands and black designers and black creators and people who usually don't get to have their stuff highlighted. She really makes sure that, and everybody, 
you listen, even in the scripts, Cameron has such, and everybody has such detailed explanations as to what we're wearing, and it's interesting to see how it's translated on screen, what it ends up becoming, because there is a deep appreciation for fashion, even in our culture, like that goes back to who we are, how we flex, how we stunt, like how we show up in a room, and for Tom, as he said in 215, that is his armor, and it's how he protects himself, it's something about um, even like the line Rowan has, having something beautiful in your life. For him, it's his nails. For Tom, it's his fashion. So fashion is a very strong storytelling tool in Tom's work. Where's the camera? I'm going to be taking everything home. <laughs> No, Your Honor, I do not recall. <laughs> I have another question from the audience. <laughs> oh, you guys are a shy crowd. Oh. I'm shaking. There's no a whole bunch of introverts. You know, this, um, oh. Some, someone? Yeah? I love like how people are now voice. ducking down, like, don't play <laughs> with me. I see a question manifesting there. <laughs> there One shirt, oh. yes. Um, we will see. Um, right now, we really love that the that the two shows exist in the same universe. And what we've done is we've put really fun Easter eggs in both shows. Um, you know, Swift Enterprises might pop up every once in a while in Nancy Drew, and you'll see later in the season what pops up in Tom Swift. Um, for that, that's what we're doing, but we'll see, maybe one day, that could be very fun. I am officially staking my claim to the fact that I want to see Nancy Drew in Head to Toe Gucci. Like, I need yeah. that on my television. No, no beanie, no, no scarves, just Gucci only. It does kind of A Gucci demand, bucket yeah. hat. Yes. The flip side of Tom being the outsider in her world, for her to land at Swift Manor and to, you know, be at a party and have to dress up or like... But we, I about. mean, we would go shopping. She wouldn't be that much of an outsider. It's fine. I'd take her She'll out. Be fine. Yeah. This is cool. Anyone else? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. The themed cocktail? I'm not going to say that out loud. Um, uh, hmm. April and I like Hennessy. Is it like a Hennessy and Coke? I is it like, there's like, like Grand Marnier. Oh, yes. Like, yeah, there you go. It was Grand Marnier. Shout out to Grand Marnier. Shout out to Grand Marnier. It's, 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 it's grown, it's sexy, yes. it's, it's everything. Yes. Absolutely, it's, it's that kind of decor. Yes. Grand Marnier rocks, maybe like a little, when they do, when they just do the orange peel, when they like smoke it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Maybe some glitter around the edge. Glitter real around. zesty, real zesty. I mean, to sidebar into authenticity, which I think speaks to that kind of like, who am I versus like what my circumstances say I'm supposed to be or supposed not to be, that's really important to the show. I will shout out to my older son who came out as trans during the pandemic. And one of the things that I really wanted this show to be was a place where he could see himself. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he could feel like, that's my story. I'm the hero. I'm the one who's having a love interest. And, you know, it's been really great to feel like he can look to all of you as kind of mentors and and folks who have gone a little farther down the road on this journey, and it's just a great community. But I want to speak to all the kids out there who are feeling like struggling quietly inside because they have to stuff down some part of themselves that, you know, I have to fit in, I have to do like everybody else does, and that takes such a toll. We want this to be a place where they can be at peace and be celebrated for who they already are. There's also just such a story to be told about the battles we take on that aren't ours. 
and how basically for all of the characters on this show, there's something there's something behind them as like that, that a legacy, a thing on their shoulders, a thing that they've been forced to do that they what that is not who they actually are and what they want to be fighting for. And so much of young adulthood is figuring out, okay, so what's mine and what's theirs? What do I have to put down and what do I have to keep going that is on my own? And that is, I think, a thing that we're very excited to explore uh, on the rest of the season. Um, I just wanted to add uh, a big thing in our show, too, is breaking tradition. You kind of see in episode one, Tom breaks tradition from how his dad has liked to do things. And when you don't have much stake in the world and you do build a legacy, it's so important. So I think both families are vying for that. And uh, like Cameron and Melinda said, you put those pressures on your children to continue and you don't get to self-actualize, which is so important for all of us to do. Um, and if you get the opportunity to do that, which I hope everybody does, um, it, it, feels, it feels fulfilling. Yeah, I think yes is the, yeah, because we, like, just hearing you say that, it reminds me of episode four where, that is about a very big tradition and things are broken in that. And I think each of us have moments where we are breaking some form of tradition and what we're used to, whether it is something that's set on us by family or by circumstance, you know, or just like their childhood, anything like that. There is a shift and a moment where you have to make a choice if it's gonna be you or them. Do we have any shippers in the audience? Cause I'm ready to ship Zenzi and Isaac. I'm just saying. <laughs> is it too early for that? I don't know. We just—I just work here. <laughs> I think we're like involved. Cameron in like stole the, my line. That's my favorite line. I just work here. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. There's opportunities for like so I'm, many. I'm feeling so the chemistry. So many hookups. There's a lot of stuff happening. You, you gotta watch. That's the point. Two men. <laughs> Two men. Any other questions from the audience? Tyrone. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, in fact, if you watch Nancy Drew, you get to meet the Bobsy twins. And I don't know, maybe the Bobsy twins come to visit Tom Swift. We love a DLM for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've we've been able to use a lot of the characters from what we call the Stratemeyer universe. Um, and so, yeah, there, we we have a lot of them. It's really fun. <clears throat> Tyrone. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Tyrone. Also, shout out to Tyrone for this lineup. I really appreciate oh, it. Yes. Um, uh, I would, what's interesting about that is that I feel like part of what I feel called to do as a writer, if we believe in, if I can say something so pretentious, um, uh, but I mean, I have on all white, so we can be pretentious, right? Uh, is, is to tell stories that are specific through which you can find universality. So with that said, this is a specific story about the life of a black gay man. Like that is what we're the story we're telling. But you can watch it and be like, ah, my dad ain't shit too. Ah, uh, I pick the wrong person sometimes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so by telling those stories and not necessarily always pausing to be like, hello, this is what we're telling, and this is why we're different, and blah blah blah, you end up being able to educate people, quote unquote, by just exposing them to emotions that they find familiar. And so that is, that is our goal. I think from the jump, we didn't want to do a story that was about coming out, because that's usually what gay people are relegated to. We didn't want to do a story that was about transition, because that's what trans people are usually relegated to. And we didn't want to do a story about like, you know, black women being angry or not being able to find a man. 
Because that's also what often what those people are relegated to. It's like, so how do we tell stories about these people's lives that feel familiar in a good way, but that are through a new lens? And so my hope is that on the off chance that a person who is not a black gay man from Oakland who is wearing all white when it's really hot outside <laughs> for no reason, uh, you can still watch the show and get it and see yourself in it and understand it and maybe learn something about a different culture in the same way that I've always learned about other cultures by watching TV that doesn't feature me. Yeah. And, and just it, to, even on set, it's, it's the same thing because everyone, the, the set is so diverse. There's people from every sort of background, white, black, Asian, all of it. But we, we never once feel different, you know? So whether you have a different sexual preference or come from a different country, you're still human, right? And I think for such a long time, we've, all of us have, as humanity have focused so much on differentiating each other, you know, to the point that we've lost our humanity, right? And I think a show like this, and so many other shows are also you know, trying to do the same. Storytelling, we all have stories to tell. And everyone's always interested in hearing something that's different, but it's still relatable to you in one way or another. So it's time to get back to our humanity. And I think, oh, that's right. I think, I think for me that is kind of one of the biggest takeaways though, as human beings, one of the biggest similarities that we have are our differences. No one human being, I don't care if you grew up in the same household, is literally exactly the same as another person. And I think, I think that that is real and true, and also so is the, the human experience of being emotional, of experiencing joy, love, laughter, pain, trauma, loss. Like these are all things as human beings that we all experience. This show is doing that right now, which is why it's so timely, it's so important, and in a way that really just allows people to see folks that exist. Yeah, that's right. They totally exist, great. we all exist. Yeah, I think in fact connection, you know, to each other, and the crew is incredibly connected to each other. It's really wonderful to go to set and just feel like there's a spirit of kindness and warmth and kind of pulling together. But I think that that actually in any episode of Tom Swift, you can see where people are connecting, wanting to connect, connecting to something that was in the past, connecting to something bigger in the country or the community in a subtle way that is very powerful and resonant, but is also told through a story with like amazing outfits and like funny dialogue. And, you know, I think that belonging to connect, in my opinion, is one of the reasons folks watch TV. It's kind of like, that's me, like I said, or that's something I'd love to be. And so we try to bring that to you on Tom Swift. And I think so far, knock wood, we're achieving it. <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much to the cast and crew of Tom Swift. Tune in at CW, watch this show, please support it. I tweet it. Jesus, um, and thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.